I've been under the watchful eye of the AMA the last few weeks. That experience seems to have dimmed my memory. I know I'm supposed to introduce the speaker tonight, but I can't recall his name. <laughs> Strangely, I do seem to recall five behavioral tendencies not necessarily deviant. Not so much in the architecture, not so much in the architecture, but underneath it, that may allow us to uncover the speaker's identity. First, the architect is pipe fitter. From Marcel Lodes and Jean Prouvé, to Lloyd's in the Hong Kong Bank. The pipe is the deity, off the shelf, prefab, and so on and so on. The pipe was architecture's Eucharist. Not anymore. The architect, the speaker, has irrevocably altered that mood smudged that perception, bent that ideal. He remodeled the pipe. It's a new metaphor now, thank God, and he did that. Second, the architect as sorcerer. Here's the proverbial academic bromide. Where do architecture's responsibilities lie? And who decides? I ask innocently, I ask facetiously. Is it to the client, utility, program, the budget, to a sociological predilection, to a philosophical predilection, to a form space conception? And who decides? Here it's the architect. And the priority isn't the budget, or utility, or philosophy. Nor does it simply prioritize what we can imagine, but it pursues what we can't quite imagine. Let me repeat that. Imagining what we can't quite imagine in the architecture, that's the job. The architect makes the buckets dance. Third, the architect is river. That old Madison Avenue promoter, Siegfried Gideon, once referred to architecture as a river flowing indefinitely from the past to the future. An architect on occasion dips into that flow and alters its course. This architect's done that. How? He's delivered a soliloquy that asks, how in the lexicon of building, not of spoken language, and this is important, how in the lexicon of building does one wonder this architect makes a language of wonder. Fourth, the architect as lion. Let's say just for fun, we're not having enough fun, let's say just for fun that the world is nothing, nothing intrinsic, only extrinsic. This architecture demands a definition and, ins and insists it's so. A ferocious act of will, of power, and of self-confidence. Architecture as the lion, never the lamb. Fifth, the architect as hand. This is the hand of the architect. 
hands-on and hands-off architecture simultaneously, a hand with a schizophrenic touch. So here's what we've got so far. A pipe main, a ledger domain, a Frankfurt on mine, a lion's mane, and a schizophrenic limon. What's left? How about Tom? Eric, um, that's moss for sure, yeah. There's uh, nothing um, more gratifying from an old, old friend and a colleague than um, those words. I'm going to be uh, moving around a bit tonight. I'm not sure I'm going to do it because I can't actually stand up for in one place for a while. I've got a bit of leg problems right now. Let me... Um, I should say first that just before I got on here, um, it was a real classic. We were, the, the group up there is just absolutely frantic. Are you guys calm down yet? <laughs> the, the gang, the <laughs> and it was really a classic. We were uh, hustling things out and I, I took a slide projector and I turned it over and the top somehow had got taken off and they all got on the floor. And I was just teasing, uh, I think, Moss and, and uh, Michael Rotundi. But the last time I saw that happen, and maybe Ray, you were there, it was Peter de Bretfel. Can you remember how long ago that was? It was probably 15 years ago. And he, but he did it in front of the audience, and uh, it was horrendous, but we kind of put them back together. This, this is, um, it seemed like a kind of an interesting opportunity, and I walk in today, and this is, this is family, and I, I, haven't, I haven't been actively participating at a teaching level here for, for six years, and it's, but it's, um, it's always my home, and it's always wonderful to come back, and it's a, it's a group of people I always very much treasure to talk to. Um, this is, of course, the 25th anniversary, and I don't know, I, anniversaries have never meant a lot to me, and it's kind of odd even to kind of think in these terms, but, but really what it, it, it is is that this, this school is, um, has survived and, and prospered um, over this period of time and made many um, transformations and changes, and, and it happens to be that by um, coincidence that it, it parallels my own um, development as an architect, and that in 1972 was a, was a departure point of, of beginning Morphosis. And I'm going to basically kind of, it's going to be more of a, a, a travel journey than it is a lecture, I think, because I've put together an obscene amount of um, projects, and there might be 40 or 50 projects. What do we, uh... <laughs> you want me even closer? Could, um, I, I put together a, <laughs> a, uh, a, a kind of a two-course meal, and there's, a, there's an appetizer and a main course. Um, could you start the first? Do you remember what the first one is? Not the pear? The one on Cyark? Are we okay? Oh, no. Not the, the four, the single one that's the precursor to the four. I've got four simultaneous projectors, and Eric, you seem to do fine with it. I hope I can do okay with it. Um, not that one, but the, the Cyarch group. That was, why don't you just set it up real quickly in the middle slide? They just put it in the projector and turn it on. Um, in 19, great, <laughs> good. Um, 1972 was, um, the, the environment was just remarkably different. And, and for those of you here that are students, uh, it would be maybe even hard to kind of imagine. Um, and of course, it's preceded by the late 60s. Um, I went to school from 63 to 68, actually 69 a hard time in my last couple of years. And uh, 
Of course, it was, a, it, was a, it was a very volatile and a very exciting time politically in this country, a very unusual time as I get older. And um, most of us were um, somewhat preoccupied outside of the academic institution. And for myself, because I really started my education in college, I was, um, barely got through high school. I was not a particularly interesting or engaged student. And when I, when I arrived at, um, at USC at the time, in kind of a fairly unlikely place maybe, um, there was a very interesting character there named Ralph Knowles. And it was a time I was getting Gary Page, I think yesterday, the day before, as we were talking about, I think it was Ian McCarg and uh, Christopher Alexander, I think Hall came up, right? I don't know if you've ever heard of these people. Um, and it was, it was my background, and it was a very much, uh, Lebius mentioned it yesterday, and a little earlier, I think, but it was this kind of, there was this void in architecture where there was this readjustment. And, it, and in very simple terms, I think, it was the kind of the end of a series of very powerful people that had operated within the, um, the, the structure of architecture and pretty much controlled the dialogue. And of course, it was Mies van der Rohe, and it was Corbusier, and it was Alto. And the, the second and third generation, the, 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 the next generations had already been in place. And, and there was something else happening, of course, and something quite important. There was the beginning of a, a, a restructuring that maybe one couldn't quite grasp at the time. I certainly did it. And it was the beginning of a series of very important texts and I think really um, a beginning of a shift of architecture from the built world to a broader conceptual category, and I'm speaking specifically, of course, of, of um, Venturi. And then maybe just before that, if you were kind of sniffing around, it would be Colin Rowe, who was a little maybe quieter for some time. And, um, but at the, simultaneous to that, um, there was this quasi-scientific kind of set of interests which erased the history of architecture. And um, it started with, a, with a, an idea that was um, trying to parallel the way one perceives the world and the way one goes about making research and investigations through a scientific method. And my own education was steeped in that. Jim, did Stafford, is he here today? No? Um, and um, I had no architectural history literally no engagement with any characters that were participating in the continuity of architecture. It was, it was, it was mathematics, it was systems research, it was the beginning of computers at the time. And um, strangely enough, simultaneously, this was with Ralph Knowles at USC, and parallel to this, there was still this other older school. And I have to say that Los Angeles was extremely um, provincial, I think, at this time, I would say. And I don't mean that necessarily in a pejorative, but it, was, it, was, it, it has its own community. It was not a part of the globe at this point. And architecture was, was, I think, in a very different place. But anyway, parallel to this kind of scientific work, there was still this other school that still existed. And at USC at the time, there were some very interesting people. There was Gregory Ain, there was Craig Elwood, there was Seriano. And finally, after it was a five-year program, in the fifth year, you got these characters. But we were so well uh, versed in a particular dialogue and, and in a belief system that was very much anti-historical, anti-continuity, which of course was very much part of the time politically. Because again, the heroes were Malcolm X, Eldridge Cleaver, um, of course the, the, the Kennedys, Martin Luther King, um, Che Guevara, and it was, it was a time of radical kind of severing right, of, of, of attempting to kind of define a new world within cultural, political terms as well as architectural terms. And so these two worlds very much meshed. And, and as you finally reach this last year dealing with these extremely kind of interesting people, um, which by the way weren't particularly verbal people, um, we basically kind of shredded them in terms of the, our ability to, our, our analytical and our, our, the way we could, we could develop a discourse and it was unfortunate at the time, as I look back and I find it very strange, but this is the way I entered architecture, and it's, it's, um, it's, it was my beginning. Um, when I left school, I started work as a planner and as urban designer, because I was really trained in systems analysis, and I wasn't prepared, of course, to deal with architecture, and uh, pursued that route. And, and, and as part of that, I, I met up with a guy named Jim Stafford, who you, you know, of course. And um, Jim was just in front of me 
at the same institution, two years in front of me, and it was prior to this change, because this whole thing only happened within about a seven, eight year envelope, and then it really reverted to something else, and, and I'm not sure every SC ever got back on its feet again to a place that was particularly interesting. And, um, hmm, anybody out there? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm just saying what I say as I believe it. Um, and, and I met this character. Well, he was a very different kind of person. Um, Jim is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a character of just immense talent and facility. And um, I was this, this character that came out of mathematics and this, this again, this kind of, uh, this, this world of analysis synthesis, this very kind of ultra-rational world. And um, he opened this other world to me. And, uh, and it was, it was, of course, a, a world that immediately started attaching one to the broader characters. Because I remember spending two years with him, and we were, I was tracing and redrawing facades of Chandigarh, and I was, I, was, I was looking and absorbing visually maybe more than I was reading or absorbing intellectually um, these major figures. And it was the beginning of a relationship that later started Morphosis and um, started my engagement um, with my first teaching job. Because again, I, and I guess there's many people here maybe in the same situation. Uh, teaching for me was a, an exploration and I really had no agenda and I had a very unclear, very murky notion of, of even what architecture was and, and I went in search of. And um, when I started um, teaching at, at uh, Cal Poly the first year, um, actually, was interviewed by Bernard Zimmerman and Ray Cappy, of course. And uh, I remember even then, Bernard, you were a little worried about me that I was already known as somebody slightly dangerous. And I think I had to go through your interview to prove that I wasn't going to blow up anybody. And I was about 26 then, so I guess things haven't changed a whole lot. Um, and we started this, this adventure at SciArc, and it was, it was a tremendous experience because it was, we, were, we were kind of mucking around and, and starting from really kind of a territory that we'd left off with, with Ralph Knowles. And um, we're very much in sync with kind of trying to pursue this, this series of ideas. At the time, it was very much about organization and notions of higher levels of order having to do with movement. And I won't go into it more than that. It would be, it'd be not important. And, and well, out of this year uh, came this kind of strange sequence in that um, there was a series of disagreements ideologically, and um, there was a Ray Cappy, of course, was, was uh, axed to exit, and again, you can tell your own story. And, and with him went five other people, and I can only speak for myself, but I know we weren't particularly well liked there at the time because we were definitely asking questions. Architecture is always about asking questions, and that's a problem to most people because they don't, might not like the types of questions you're asking. And this school was definitely not interested in, 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 at all in the types of issues that we were bringing up. And we were seemed to absorb vast amounts of time of our students at the expense of other courses, at the expense of some other agenda. And of course, those are the days when, um, boy, I'm, I'm not a, afraid of a very good teacher these days. I'm, I'm, I, I'm so kind of jammed up with so many activities, I kind of come in and out of the studio. These were days that you showed up at um, 10 in the morning and left at midnight, sometimes five days a week. And, maybe Saturday and Sunday, because our studio was our studio. It was our laboratory, and it was the best place to be. And it was also, again, the early 70s, and survival seemed just much simpler then. I'm revealing my elderly status or something, but it was in, it's, it's true, is we lived in a little apartment in Venice that cost 50 bucks, and you, you didn't seem to need anything. And uh, we, were, we lived collectively, and it was, a, it was a different time, for sure. But, but the studio was our world. And then out of that came, out of that, um, which I have to say I don't personally think is that unusual. I think schools go through those kind of turmoils. That, that event came, I think, something that was very extraordinary. And it took place when um, Ray um, had the insight um, to, to, to have this idea of organizing a new school and bringing with us um, the five younger kind of faculty that were interested in this idea, and I think 44, somebody correct me, Ray or Michael. Um, and of course, it sets this strange, this, again, we're a family, because Michael, of course, was, was part of that class. And if I remember right, most of the class were seniors, which was a pretty 
um, brave thing to do, considering they were going from a, a degree program to something that didn't even exist. And here we are, um, 25 years later. Um, could, do I move these or do you move these? Forward. And I just, as nostalgia, if I remember right, Jim and I were given the task of designing a system. The, 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 the other one you saw, the geodesics, came from Pomona, if I remember right. And there was this occupation of this really quite wonderful old warehouse. I, I still miss it a bit. It had a tremendous character for those of you, oh my god. <laughs> Some of you, of course, is of you know, old Grandona, who no one would ever forget if you met him. And um, again, it's this kind of really unique time. And it was so simple because everyone was willing to literally build from, wow, is it, that was Shelley in there, that right? No, I didn't even notice that. Build from the beginning up this, um, this place for investigating ideas that in some way connected to, to architectural thought. You could tell we were still interested in uh, pipes, <laughs> but we were very early and interested in the detailing of uh, pipes. And really, the, um, I think the, the first year was really more about, really maybe the first two years, was more about really the invention of this place. You can start the, um, the four now, if you would, please. Um, than it was anything else. And, and in many ways, I think it, it probably took the first two or three years even to, to evolve a, a school that was in a more maybe conventional way dealing with the, the pedagogical kind of aspect of education. I have to make one. I have to speed it up, otherwise we're going to be here all night. Um, there should be a four slide. It should say 1972. Um, one quick step backwards, and then it'll be kind of a straight path. Um, in my last year, of, uh, in 1968, 69, at USC, um, I'd become acquainted with a group of people that had, that had just come to UCLA. And um, UCLA at that time was truly another very remarkable place. Um, they had just started their architecture program under a guy named Harvey Perloff, who's a planner. And they brought this group of people out who I had just become aware of and where our name comes from. Um, and it was, of course, um, Green and Schalk and Heron and Peter Cook. And they had found their way um, to UCLA. And um, the year that we were, you can't find this last, the year that um, this last year, which was somewhat difficult for us at USC, um, we started moving over to UCLA and all of these things were taking place, tent structures and these, these, these um, pneumatic, um, nomadic um, structures. And um, they just completely took the place by storm. And it was amazing because they filled up the quad, they filled up all the space inside and outside. And as one started talking, at the time, the two people I got to know were Peter Cook and Ron Heron. It was just completely captivating. And just before that, um, or I, sh I should say, yeah, it was just at that time, I was starting to look at the Archigram comic books. And I had met Jim Stafford, and he was introducing me to these things. And um, they had a profound effect on our beginning, again, coming from this kind of zero uh, background literally this, this datum that represented a completely kind of scra scraping away of, of anything as a departure point in a traditional architectural sense. Um, this is the first project that, that Jim and I did. And um, I should say that the, the name, it's obvious, it, it, it comes from a, a collective nature of the work and it comes from a notion of a, of a place that could shrink and expand. And, and it, was, it was taken literally from kind of an idea that they had for and years, years later, I was, I was having dinner with Wolf Pricks maybe seven, eight years ago, and for some reason we were talking about this, and, and his name, by the way, was located in the same place. 
because this was a very, very influential, this was the 60s really, I think. There's no way you could talk about the 60s without really seeing it from, from their perspective. And, and we went about working with um, Roland Cote, and probably very few of you know of this person, another kind of very extraordinary Los Angeles architect which gave up architecture um, many years ago to paint. And we were working with him on this um, large housing complex, and it represented at the time um, a beginning kind of interest in this um, exposable, expendable, flexible kind of environment. A year later, oh, they're above, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I couldn't see it because it was above my head. Um, A year later, just as CIRC was formed, um, we met Michael Rotundi and another Michael, Michael Brickler. And um, we got involved in our first um, project. It was a, actually a quasi real project for a school that my son was going to at the time. And it was the beginning, uh, upside down, um, of a, um, of course, a long relationship with Michael. And um, it still was, the project was completely centered in this notion of an A architecture, that, that there was a suppression of the aesthetic. It was about this kind of pure rational world. And um, it, was, it was about the pure expression of program or the lack of expression of program. And um, it was flexible and it, it was about this, a metabolic skin that was able to change both in this case from climatic purposes and, and for program. And, and Prouvé was certainly another one, Moss, <laughs> was one of those influences that was um, part of this thinking at the time. One of the things that happened through um, the involvement at the beginning years of CIRC is that I think that there was a very strong um, relationship between the faculty and that, and that there was a, um, an, a somehow an agreement that um, all of us were required to um, nurture and to develop and it was um, something that has occurred to me during this, this, this search we're going through right now that, that I think is still very important that, this, that the school was, and, and, and Ray of course was kind of the major figure in this, this kind of idea that the school wasn't there just for students, but it was there for the nurturing of the ex, next generation of architects. And um, it, it allowed us to, to, to practice in a certain way and it allowed us to, to travel. And uh, I'd spent literally all of my summers traveling. And um, through this first connection with the Archogram boys and with Mike Davies and a group of people that worked under them who are now working in Pompidou, um, I was making treks every summer kind of watching this this building go up. And, and again, it was, it was, there was a direct kind of connection where the, this, this work, which started so programmatically, was now starting to find or in, in, in the, in have hints of some form that it was taking some shape. And again, I think at this time, um, It was, um, it's hardly really to fathom. It seems so, um, it was very unconscious and it was, um, seemed so unsophisticated and so disconnected. Um, I'm kind of, it's, I always find it quite remarkable today that I, I find students so much more sophisticated because we were just groping and, um, really had no clear idea, just searching of where we were headed for. And then right after that, um, we got involved. A, 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 one of um, my students brought us um, a project in, in Mexico, and it was a, it was a medical building. And um, we went to work again, kind of part of the same set of principles. There was a, a year off after this thing, there were a few years of of basically kind of less activity. And then um, at the time we were shifting and starting a, a graduate program. And um, 
through that process, I, I was heading up the graduate program at that time, and, and myself wasn't a graduate, and it was decided that I was uh, kind of unfit for the, for the position and needed to go back and get some education. And so, of course, I went to Harvard, then needing um, that type of validation. I remember talking to Moss at the time, and he was telling me I was wasting my time. And um, spent a year kind of mucking around and um, even started reading. And, um, but there were a few people there that were, that were quite interesting. And again, this is um, 1978, 79. And um, I worked with Matthias Ungers. And um, Sterling was there. And um, by this time, he was clearly a person that had an enormous effect on me. And was a, a mentor in abstentia, in a way. Um, and I was, the, the reading at that time, or the, the interests, were very much centered around Tafuri and Aldo Rossi. And I was um, intrigued in this, in this, what became a very antithetical, this kind of reverse position of this kind of radical engagement in construction. And um, when I got back um, in 1979, um, we had a series of commissions that were brought to us immediately. They were all connected to friends that I'd known through the Indochina, Indochina Peace Campaign, the anti-war movement, that were all kind of growing up. And um, Mike and I started working on these projects, and this was the first of them, the 2468 House. And it's um, strange to look back today, it was so kind of primitive. And it's, um, but it, in fact, was the beginning of a, of a, it started rooting certain ideas that I guess I've never kind of shifted from. And one of them is the, a, a grounding in Platonic geometry, which became a, literally a grounding device. And, but in this case, um, one that was more interested in an exploration between that platonicness and the contingency of the world, the diversity of, of the environment, and one that was um, attempting to be very site-specific through that a set of ideas. And then a series of projects which were um, all attempting to, um, or was an investigation in um, an architecture which, just, which described itself very much connected to its constructional processes and a description of those processes were, which were very much part of the work. Simultaneously um, utilizing a strategy of connection or relationships that were all grounded in the, um, the idea of appropriating the specificity or the idiosyncratic nature of these places. From the um, single objects that, that were these explorations, um, there was a beginning of another idea of connection, which was one that was very traditional, or very much part of a convention, which had to do with an idea of uh, village clutter, or a much more kind of relaxed notion of associating work to um, the relationship of a series of pieces, which in turn was very much about movement and the narrative movement and a, a method of the way one understands a very simple organization, the, the Cohen House. And then a project which I think in um, some ways was a real benchmark, and that I think during this time, it's, we were working in a way that probably was the, pushed us the closest to a very um, literal um, set of responses, particularly in terms of the material language and to the language, which was, um, I think, very literally vernacular. And after the, the completion of the, the Lawrence House, it was something that um, troubled us, and it was something we really went to work on. And it had to do with um, looking for a, a broader, more abstract method of speaking about these relationships and these engagements, both with site and through the notion of making or building. And I think the, um, the, um, 
Venice Three House, the Ann Bergen House, was um, very much a part of that. And of course, it started um, a very um, specific investigation having to do with the role of materials and the relationship of materials to an organizational idea. Um, as an aside, the, the, the footnote, um, it, it was the first time that um, I started exploring with a computer. We were given a, a computer. It was actually a, today it would be a joke. It was a doorstop. Michael, I don't even remember what it was. It was a little Macintosh. It probably had three RAM or something. Um, and um, it was actually a, a diagram of, of, this, of this building. And um, started a uh, kind of a relationship with this set of idea. At the time, I had absolutely no interest in this and found it just enormously constricting. Like from this point, there was, a, there was a period of, I don't know, three or four or five years where we were um, pursuing um, the development of a language which had to do with various ideas of organization, um, boundaries, inside and outside, the reinterpretation or the reordering of the role of structure, um, the rereading of the conventions of an architecture, where walls, structure, light, space, all um, are starting to um, operate multivalently, coterminously, at several levels, and are starting to blur the edges of their um, very prescribed definitions. And that there's a period of a time, I think, where you just start working out variations of these ideas. And um, at this point, as is obvious, um, certain mechanisms and form, repetition, um, a search for rules and laws, which I'm still fascinated in, and um, an attempt at defining a rigor that has to do with these laws. And, and, and maybe in some way that stayed with me from my earlier education and that I'm extremely committed to uh, the conceptual formation and the rules of the work outside of oneself. And it's what, if there's any single idea that I'm preoccupied with, it's this, this territory between one's own ego and one's own facility and the broader understanding of a language that's beyond oneself, that's translatable. And, and in some ways, um, I, I think I've maintained a, an ambivalence towards that, and, and any of the people that have, that have worked in the office would, would know that, that, that I vacillate from complete disinterest in formal issues, and I'm only interested in pursuing an idea and the, uh, the understanding of the rules of that idea as they're manifested architecturally from the other end of the spectrum of being very personally attached in a very conventional level, wanting to have my hand on every little piece, but but I, I'm swinging radically back and forth, and I'm, and I'm still to this day extremely ambivalent about these, these two territories. But it may be somehow that the work represents that ambivalence. Um, and then a project, which was a project for my house, which again, I think was um, for myself the next derivation of the Venice Three House maybe, but one now which was much more interested in the, um, the nature of the container and the, um, the dialogue with this early platonic cube, because this is really a distorted cube, it's not that distorted maybe, but it's really about the surface condition of this work, and in this case one where each of the surfaces is responding very specifically to an interpretation of the site and is no longer attached to a singular idea of what a building is. It's imploding, it's coming from the outside, not the inside. And yet, simultaneously, it's very much about uh, a notion which um, defines the in privacy of the interior to the public nature of an ex exterior. Part of the, um, the subtext of the, of the Sixth Street House had to do with um, an interest in a, in a certain idea of mechanical objects. And um, at the time, um, we were talking about it as dead tech. Um, and a technology 
that the pipe, Eric, hmm, this, it wasn't that many slides ago we were looking at Pompidou and a building that was fairly, literally mimetic to that. And um, I think what he's looking for constantly is kind of a territory. Where can one explore? And it seemed as though it was a territory that was already um, well underway. And what became, I think, much more interesting to us was um, re-strategizing the, the technical aspiration of architecture, because don't forget that, of course, modernism is completely connected to the aspiration of technology. Yeah? And um, as one explores that idea within cultural, social, political terms, you have to, I think, confront it at that level. And I have to say, um, it, it wasn't working. And, and, and where one can maybe appreciate Hong Kong, Shanghai, and I happen to very much, um, I find its, its politics or its conceptual strata um, hopelessly lost in the early part of the century. And that nobody could believe today in the kind of optimism of technology as a driver, as a, as a motivator of architecture. It, it's, it's absolutely absurd. And um, if, you, if you read the front page and listen to the, the news every day, it would be impossible to see that. That, of course, we see technology within very, very different terms. And I've always enjoyed the analogy between Kubrick's 2001 and um, Lucas's Star Wars. They were made about three years apart. And, and Kubrick, again, was somehow trapped in 1940. And he was so completely captivated by this kind of pure technological stuff, right? And, and by the time it got to to Lucas, you were, it was bubble gum getting stuffed in, you were banging stuff, and it was, right? And it's, um, of course, he's a contemporary guy, and, it was, and understands this kind of stuff. And, and we got immediately involved in, 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 a, in an idea of, of um, reinterpreting the, the role of technology, not in a functional, pragmatic way, but the way it speaks and the way it participates in the work, how, it, how it's, it's, its contribution to the overall um, sensibility of the work. And, um, and again, it's merging from its literal role in terms of support or its dealing with gravity to its broader conceptual roles. And again, that's a territory that, um, that I've stayed with and I, uh, it continues to, um, to occupy me. And then, as we proceeded through various works, um, it became clear that this, this one interest had many expressions and possibilities. In the case of the Kate Mandolini, it was, in fact, a condenser. It was something that, that, um, that within a very compact um, constructional composition, could speak about the larger work in a way that was quite different than the architecture. There's another aspect, of course, of this work that's, that's, um, that became part, uh, that we're participated in and, and we're part of, a, I think, a Los Angeles culture. And, and of course, um, many of you are out there are, are, are part of this. And that had to do with a, a, a particular way of making which started to expand the traditional terms of the way architects operate. And of course, this was taking place much earlier in the little houses because we were very much involved in their construction. We were contracting them and all that kind of stuff. And, um, but it started a, a broader collaboration. Um, Tom Farage is here today. And, and Tom literally has been a, an, an outgrowth. He's, a, he's literally a part of the office in a way. And that um, many of these things were produced and they're produced very much in situ kind of working on the material. And I have to say very early on that this became also um, very much an aspect of the way one works, that one works not completely intellectually or conceptually, one works on the material of the work. Yeah? And of course part of this was also distancing oneself from the commercial or the, um, the more direct purposes of the work. I don't particularly have an enormous interest in the, um, the way the world operates today in a day-to-day -day sense commercially. And there was always implicit in the work that there was a distance between our interests and the interests of commerce. Another piece in um, 
a, a, an apparatus in NARA that just again pursues this. And then every once in a while, um, you could take some time out and, uh, and play. And um, throughout this time, we were producing objects of desire, um, kind of operating within a very different time framework, the barking dog lamp and the angel lamp, um, and also operating in, 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 a, in a very clear way in terms of this, this, this direct connection with, with making completely free of the normal kind of processes of drawing and conceptualizing. And, and at the same time, pursuing this connection with the human figure and this notion of architecture, which is haptic, which is tactile, which is, has this very direct engagement and um, a series of pieces that were very much about um, their literal engagement with the human figure. All of them in some way are, re have response mechanisms. They're, they're, they move or have some ability to um, respond to, to the human figure. And then at times, um, these apparatuses have an ability to um, activate a much more neutral space. When we were um, involved in, in the Cedar sinai Cancer Clinic, um, it was a project which really wasn't about architecture in a, in a formal sense. It's, it's like a theater. It was a backdrop for, for very complicated medical procedures. And these elements were, were there to, um, to recall a more active engagement within this background. Where am I? What was the last date? Was it, uh, what was the last date? The 70 what? 80? 80 what? You can't, you, can't, you can't remember my name. I can't remember the project or the dates. <laughs> um, ended up with a really completely different kind of project. Um, a client came in the door and had a piece of property, and it was, it was up in Santa Barbara. And it was, a, it, was a, it was a part of a rural kind of territory. And um, never been engaged in this. And again, it was um, years later, I, through different discussions, it became clear that my generation, our generation, um, was in a very different position in Los Angeles and that the generation before us essentially was still building on more or less um, empty, virgin, unbuilt land and was still filling out this immense place of Los Angeles. Yeah? And um, by the time we came along, it was finally getting filled and it's kind of only moving at the edges and, and which is obvious by most of the work. It was, there were interventions and there were retrofits and right, they were engaged in other structures. And, and so this was a very, very different kind of piece of work. And it required a, a, a very different departure point. And um, we moved within a very different territory. And we're, really, we're looking at with, with organization that now was separate from any notion of connection or engagement requiring a, um, an urban or a suburban context, but one now which had to be freestanding and which had to rely on ideas that were to imported or brought to the project. The, um, the project, of course, was, um, we don't lose this guy, was um, departed from ideas which had started 10, 15 years earlier, Smithson, Heiser, Mary Miss, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, harked to a, 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 an earlier architecture, a, a primordial, prehistoric architecture that had to do with a much more kind of fundamental idea of scraping, marking, occupying the site. And it was, again, it was, a, it, was a, it was a building that started a trajectory, which I'm still extremely interested in, which has to do with a very another kind of engagement, because it starts a discussion of operating on the site in a very different way than the, the paradigm that we were left with, which I would say was Savoie an object in contrast to nature, and it was one which was looking for an engagement which was much more connected and one much more seen as operating on the site itself. Um, did the building do that? 
Um, not even close. Um, but, the, but the interest was this idea of, of the reverse villa, a building at the periphery, a building which was um, holding the site and which was um, literally um, a layer, a mapping of systems which had to do with these layers of, of markings, these incremental markings, which, which again talk about movement, talk about exploration, and, and find another method of uh, finding a language which comes from the relationship of these various um, lines and incremental procedures. The, the work we do, of course, is always um, collaborative. And I'm speaking here about clients. And um, when we started on the Crawford House, the, the, they were very interested in the early dialogue of the things I'm talking about. Because we were, we were talking about Nazca, and we were talking about these, these ideas, which, hark, which again, were very kind of radical in their, in, in their, their attack on, on the conventionality of a domestic environment. But by the time we really got to it, they were much more interested in much earlier work, like the, like the Cohen House, and, um, which was much more involved in a, um, a convention of an architectural language, and one which was also very much connected to a very domestic kind of an idea of what a house is. When we started the, the Chiba project in, in, um, in Japan a couple years later, it, it, it's very much literally a working out of these ideas within the, um, I think, a, a framework which is able to suppress the more conventional elements that we were forced to deal with in the, uh, the Crawford House. And one which now is finding a mechanism through a series of walls and through a series of uh, spatial events, which are carvings, these incremental carvings. You're looking at the increment in the, the footnote. Um, that the building literally disappears and becomes this space Heiser's double negative, or the, 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 the carved portion of that earth, and that the work literally is inhabited between this in-between world of these two walls, one of them informing the larger site and the other one producing the space of the automobile that represents the transition from the city to the country. And then between that, these series of spaces which are carving into the ground that make up the program, and then countering that, a single object which has the traditional placement and utilizes the horizontal um, view of the site, et cetera. And of course, um, these discussions are, are, are really always um, kind of impossible because speaking about work and placing slides in an order requires a lineality. And of course, it's, nothing could be farther from the way work develops. But, and I, I wanted to show these because it, as I was looking through the slides, we're done much, much earlier, the Vietnam way earlier in the, in the middle 70s, the Berlin Wall um, fairly close. But we had already been interested or started recognizing that there's, there's times when, in fact, um, it was impossible to produce architecture within its conventional terms of building. And the Vietnam competition was a project which was very interesting in that regard that we literally came to a place where we were confronted with the idea that it was impossible to place an object on the site, and it demanded another strategy. And in this case, it was one where we, we, cut, a slice in the, we cut a slice in the mall, a carving with two walls, and the walls were sheared, and they, they, were, they were a hand distance apart, and they represented um, this, this, this shear, which, which was parallel to the, um, the violence of the war, and yet they talked about the humanity of the connection of people that, that, that are bounded by this connecting wall, because at this time um, it was very much connected to Foss' very beautiful poem on the, the mending wall. The wall is a conduit versus the wall is a separator. And the Berlin project um, for East-West Berlin, for Christine for Rice, was very much part of that also, as we were dealing with this condition of, of East and West and this oppositional strategy, but in this case, as one walked this, this parallel zone of this boundary, west was on east and east was on west, and these series of stitches allowed people to literally break this boundary as part of a social conduit. The Vietnam again.
And then at this point, it became quite clear that there were two very divergent strategies that seemed to be predominant. One which was urban-based and which was um, oriented to uh, a reflexive response set of mechanisms that came from the site. And another one which was much more instigating, um, provoking a site condition. And um, this was a, an, another project that was, was part of that. It was, a, it was a competition for a gatehouse for uh, Cranbrook. And again, in this case, um, it had an opportunity of finding a very different resolution between the scale of the interventions, because the only real intervention was this little gatehouse and this entry condition, and the idea of using these small pieces to engage a very large piece of land versus the, the opposite condition, a competition that we won for the, um, for the arts park competition, which was a, which was a um, 2,500 seat proscenium theater and a black box theater. And of course, those of you that know that is placed out in the valley in the Sepulveda Dam area. And they had this kind of very interesting possibility of putting a theater in the suburbs with a 35 foot height limit. And so White Array realized that you could, you could make the connection between this very kind of strange, I mean, of course, the theater has a 110 foot proscenium, right? So you recognize you're looking at this very unusual condition of a building that literally has to be underground to operate within the, 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 the legal kind of premises of the site. But simultaneously, you could start reducing a piece of work that had to do much more with the scale of a park, where the elements that were, that were described were much more part of a series of pavilions, which were part of a larger complex of 200 acres. And again, a very different kind of mechanism of exploring this um, territory between landscape and architecture. But architecture, which literally is seen as a device which is participating in the um, the uh, augmenting and in the definition of what, lands, what landscape is, what nature is. In the Berlin project, we're back now to the other pendulum. Um, an expansion of existing um, library in Berlin, um, a piece of work that we took a prize for. Um, where can I go back? Starting from the little houses, um, as I'd mentioned, the, the smaller work always attempted to allude towards an aspiration of somehow absorbing world, right? Finding a method of, of, um, of celebrating the, um, the diversity and the complexity of these conditions. As the work increased in scale, what became much more implicit or directional in, in a conceptual way for the larger projects was able to develop in a much more explicit way. So in this project, you're looking at a work that literally is defined as a series of um, engagements which are specifically responsive to their found conditions. And again, I, there's no reason to go through it all, but whether it's a, a piece of a, a, of a low part of a building and a berm that's absorbing a park and a church, which is part of the social kind of order, or whether it's a piece of the building that's part of the 19th century structure of Berlin, on and on. The building literally is a mechanism that's absorbing, reinterpreting, kind of reinventing these found conditions. Many of these projects are built on previous projects. When we went to work on a competition for NARA, um, three theaters on this, um, the site of the vague triangle. Um, it was very much a critique of the last job I showed you. Um, Steve Hall won the, the Berlin competition. It was never built and has actually taken away from it. It was given to Karen Van Leggen. It was taken away again. And um, we'd had many, I was completely flabbergasted. I, I thought we had, we, we thought we had this one completely in the bag and we were convinced we'd won it. And when Steve won it, um, I was just blown away. And it was a kind of goofy little building. And I spent a lot of time thinking about it and talking about it. And, and, but what he did was the opposite of what we did, is he made it a very enigmatic, kind of very powerful kind of form that had a presence. And I think what happened with that strategy, and I have to say I'm still struggling with it, is that the building became so laden with its responsibilities that finally was maybe unable to capture 
kind of its own essence. And it's, it's, so, it's funny because it's something that we've talked about for years that finally the work is about attention and the tension is derived from its ability to collect and conserve and to be responsive in, in a traditional way and its ability to confront, to interject that convention with something that um, is, um, speaks of its own time and speaks of its own issues, isolated from the agenda of the first. And um, this is the project that we went to work on attempting to correct this situation and a work which became much more um, active in both its language um, and its, um, the way it interacts with the site, which is trying to find this, maintain this middle ground, but to reactivate the, um, the interventional aspect of our, of our um, dealing with this very large site and which is, oh, I'm not sure if I have another slide of this. It also starts an attitude where we're now starting to merge these two ideas, the ones that's coming from the site and the one that comes from its urban connection. And the site itself is tipping. We're starting to operate now on the land. And again, we're starting to challenge this idea of, of the way one occupies a site where one puts a building down and the land is left more or less passive. So the architect operates within this territory, the landscape architects in this ter territory. We're starting to deal with the total project. And then parallel to this, it's becoming, um, hmm, we're starting to move the language and um, their interests into a vocabulary which is um, starting to move away from this insistence on the platonic language and we're moving into ideas of open spaces which are much more interstitial and much more uh, uh, activated and a bit vaguer and ambiguous as to their definition. We're back again to something else. Um, territory one. Um, when one um, attempts to respond in Los Angeles, of course, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an invention because it's, it's not a city that has um, a, a, a tradition of, of buildings that one values or a, um, an organizational layering that, that becomes part of a structure of a city like you would find in, in Europe. And um, where in some cases these, these works were very much engaged in, in, in the building itself, like has been so much a part of Moss's career, I'm thinking of 72 Market Street or Kate Manalini that were operating within the context of the work. At a larger um, um, urban level, I think it's extremely difficult. And, and this was a project where we were operating within a more um, um, interpretive kind of territory where we were making assumptions because we were interested in fronts and corners and we were interested in scale and, and, and reinterpreting this kind of very strange location of this object and its non sequitur position but basically kind of hunkering down and, and, and committing ourselves to, again, this relational strategy of a piece of work which is always made up of a series of other pieces of work and it's not seen as a singular thing, but it's, it's immediately seen as a multiple, it's seen within a, a series of fragments of, um, of works that, that have an interactive kind of possibility. And again, one which is very directly interested in that engagement as it, as it talks about the power of relationships, the power of being able to speak and to communicate. Because I'm extremely interested in, in, in those engagements that have some level of resolve. I'm not interested in the happenstantial collisions of things. I'm interested in, in the resolve of those things. And again, it goes back to a, uh, a demand for a certain set of laws or rules that, um, that very much uh, inform the work. And then again in Tokyo, one which was very much more contextual, literally to a site where we could discuss a building in terms of an open-ended project, which was literally a part of an unfinished work, which talked about its future and made allusions to its future through the um, association with the activity that's implied by its unfinishedness. And at the same time, a series of forms which are um, literally absorbing 
the found environment. And they discuss scale, they discuss texture, they discuss the, the various conditions of um, Higashi Azabu, which is a district of Tokyo. As we had a chance to work on larger scale work, um, we're going back to a set of interests which are much more connected to the Berlin Project and to the NAR Project. And um, for me, this was um, kind of a, a critical piece of work at an urban level that I'm going to probably work with for the rest of my life. Um, we had the, the fortune of being invited to this competition. It was essentially a, a, an Austrian-Hungarian competition. They invited, I think, 25 people from around the world. And we took a prize in it, which led to a, a continuation of work in, in Vienna over the years. But it was one which, um, for myself, started to um, have an ability to bring these two territories together. One which was interested in a, um, an organizational strategy which was very much about the engagement and continuity and reflection and responsiveness to a found environment. And that's going to be a long discussion specifically, and I don't think it's required here. And the second one had to do with a, um, an idea which engaged the land, the landscape. Um, and in this case, with this broad sloping form, which became part of the programmatic data of the building. And in this case, actually took over 50% of the program. And we're in a position now where there's, we've completely, I, I think, redefined the tradition of figure ground. The, the, the object and the static ground, that there now is no figure ground relationship. The ground is being manipulated as is the object. And we're operating on these two territories and we're literally operating on the site, the complete site. We're no longer operating on a piece of work as a building, we're operating on the site as, as a gestalt, as a complete entity. And in this one that links the river, the island, and this, this interstitial site between um, UN City and this, this island, and one which had a very fascinating idea, which was its first phase was going to be Expo 95. Um, that was two years ago, of course. And the second phase was going to be an, 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 a, um, an expansion of the city. And it was a really a tremendous idea. And it was extremely unfortunate it didn't happen. And you're looking at one of these early models as we were looking and exploring at um, this notion of, of work, which is now um, stripping away the traditional organizational fabric, lines, grids, repetition, and is looking for an organization which only utilizes um, idiosyncratic found data that one would, could maybe find in a city or layered with time historically. And then again, where, where the, the plate, the tectonic plate, the plate of the Earth itself is now engaged and active and is uh, programmatically part of the project. A few years later, um, a competition entry for the spray bogan. And um, absolutely the same focus, very different language. Um, a site, um, the site, by the way, is the, this, of course, and it's a connection with the tear garden. Um, using not the site, but the edge of the site, um, using a gover government center literally as a connecting device, an early sketch, which again goes back to the wall schemes that I showed you much earlier, the notion of the, the, the wall as a connecting device, as a literally weaving together um, so a social fabric, and one in this case which, which um, alters the, the very obvious object relationship of the governmental ministries into one of infrastructure and fabric, where they disappear into the fabric of, of, of quasi-landscape, quasi-urban structures, all of which become part of this, the Spray River and um, engaged with the historical background, the, maybe even the rootedness of the Germanic culture um, as a part of this, this origin of the city. Um, and um, again, represents maybe the, the, an interest and an idea very separate from its it's um, physiognomic, it's look, it's, it's stylistic, right? The, 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 it's, it's presence formally, because the two ideas are actually quite parallel, but they have very different 
repercussions having to do with the specificity of the, of the sites and of the programs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because I'm showing these things chronologically, um, we're moving around a bit, and I hope you can just kind of stay with me. Um, we're back to the Crawford House, yeah? And uh, we're working again with that project. And we're working with it in a very different way than we were able to work with the JPGA project, the golf course. And um, now we're still at the scale of the, it's basically a similar type of project, it's a residence. And um, you'll see some shifts. Um, there were, again, there's a series of, of corrections that are made. The, the wall never really had an interior and it wasn't even understood until we built it and it just didn't work. What really, really needed is an interior understanding because the, the whole idea was to claim the site with a room and the room was not a, it was, it was, a, it was a, f a, a, a fragment of a room and it was the largest gesture and it's a gesture that claimed the site. And, um, and then the language is shifting a bit and it's moving away from the, from the, um, the demands of the, um, of again, the, the tradition of a domesticity and of a, of a language of, of house into something that's more um, compatible with the aspirations of the work as it's connected to the land. And like the Crawford, there's of course this continual engagement with exterior, interior, which includes the wall that becomes part of the interior of the project and then a series of crevices. The, the deepest kind of cut in the house becomes the shower. And so one is, um, that's another discussion. I've always thought it was obvious that uh, one's work is connected with human activities, that these things are not formal devices. They have to do with simple activities. And, and in this case, is, is the, the shower represents kind of the epicenter. And they're looking at kind of a piece of that as it slices through the building. All of them having transparencies that describe the various elements. Okay, there's a second I'm going to go through much more briefly. Um, 94, was that the earthquake? That's my office then. And uh, boy, there's times you really wonder why you went into architecture. This was one of them. Uh, we had a whole roof fall in, and it was raining the next day. And I was sitting at my desk. Uh, on a Saturday morning at about 7 in the morning, 8 in the morning, and uh, turned my camera around, and this is what my office looked like. And I was contemplating um, my position in the world and uh, kind of where the next move was, other than the obvious of cleaning up my office. Um, but there was a, a shift. Whoop, yeah. Um, We're starting to work on um, larger projects and projects that tend not to be in Los Angeles. And um, I'd been kind of toying and kind of watching at a distance this, this, this um, infiltration of the computer. And it was um, still not at all even vaguely interested. And it became um, kind of more and more difficult because it's, as you know, of course, it's um, one really can't even construct anymore. That, it's the medium of engineers and it's the medium of communication. And you should get a site plan today, it's on a disk, right? And we were, I remember going over to talk to Peter Budd, who was the head of Overup, and he literally walked me over to a desk and it was the only desk in the office that had a parallel bar and said, Maine, this is your desk, right? This is where we do your work. And uh, you gotta get hip, because we're not gonna keep it very long. And, um, and so we started in a, in, a, in a way that seemed to be much more kind of pragmatic and started mucking around and, and well, here's a project and we're still in the ground. It's a, a, a building we did in, for the LA Unified and it's, um, those of you that start working for the city, you realize what a horror it is. We've been working for six years and we're still on a programming schematic. And we'll probably work six more years. And um, you're looking at kind of a retrofit that um, we're working on now. And um, hmm, this is a, another competition we did for American Business Center. It's, it's, again, this, these two engaged buildings, one that kind of comes from the inside and doesn't, doesn't really uh, deal with the confines of the site, and another one which is very much about the tradition of Berlin walls, and it's about the, the struggle of these two pieces of work as they uh, deal with the violation of the site. And um, 
and another one that's, that's dealing with a roof structure, which is literally part of a landscape. And, and some of these just become kind of fragments. This is a competition in Frankfurt. And, and uh, God, it's funny, as I'm putting these slides together, we're, we were discussing kind of what it means to be an architect in this relationship to construction. And I don't think there's actually much relationship, frankly, of, although I think it, in many cases it's extremely important to build for certain people. And, and a certain part of me, I, I think that, like many of you, I think that it's actually important to build. But I have to say that in many cases, it's probably equally important not to build. And um, many of these works, I'm completely happy with leaving them, and they don't have to be realized, and especially when you realize what's going to happen to them, they do get realized. And, um, and they're, just, they're just pieces of exploration. And you're, if you're interested and engaged in them, that's enough. And, um, and today, I think it's getting less and less possible, actually, that there just isn't the, the distance between the world and its interest in architecture and the relationship of architecture today, I, I can't imagine being any wider. And um, I, I, uh, I suspect that there's going to be more and more of you and me that are going to do less work and, and more investigation. And at some time, culture will re-engage us and will be interested in this work. But at this time, there's very few people other than this kind of singular patrons that even have any vague interest in what we do. Um, and um, well, this is some of the interstitial stuff. And you can see kind of traditional models and beginning of computer models. And um, we're kind of just starting to walk. And I'm very kind of uncomfortable and very um, find it a bit difficult. But then again, um, well, as soon as we had a few of these machines, and we realized that it was an all or nothing, and it's my style anyway. I don't kind of like slow transitions. I like to kind of dive in the deep end. And um, it seemed as though there was really kind of no middle ground. We either you're going to work this way or we're not going to work this way. And so at some point, we just cleaned the office. And it was literally, it took a day. And um, took all the pens and mylar and parallels, put them in a huge bag, and sent them to Kazu Arai, who was um, really our third partner for 10 years, an amazing man, has his own office now in, Los in, in, um, in Tokyo, in um, Kyoto, in um, Kyoto actually, and, um, and started working with this, another set of ideas. And uh, that, that if we could, <clears throat> if we could um, find a, a resonance or kind of a usefulness for this idea, and it seemed from, from a, uh, a very pragmatic point of view that it, it's, it's an extremely demanding tool and that it wants to do everything and it seems like its connective ability from small scale to large scale and from the most infinite, de from the, the smallest detail to the largest macro kind of organizational notion, um, that there's this ability to make connection. And then there's immediately some things you realize that it's, it, it actually is, has a potential of really operating in some ways that are very um, current, say in terms of uh, hierarchy. Because I would say one of the things that that community of architecture is interested in today, one of the issues that's that's interesting, is this notion of hierarchy, right? And we're essentially, I think, most of the people I know, in one way or another, are somehow attacking the this this order or this notion of hierarchy as it's been as it's been handed to us. And and there, it seems as though that the, the the science today and the world today is demanding something different. Of course, this is a discussion that's going on close to 150 years and, and started in the middle of the 19th century. We know that, and um, but it was it was coalesced maybe in, in, in a very crisp way in the beginning of the century through painting. And again, we know that. Um, but then, what the computer allows you to do is you can actually move around a bit, and you don't have to work. It's not planned section elevation anymore. You know, you can you can work like you think. You can, you can become involved in some small detail, and you can get involved in an idea that's cl closer to an idea of DNA and work from a detail out. And all of you know that, right? You can start with something very, very small and, and, and develop a larger idea through that. Or you can develop in a more conventional way through a conceptual strata, a conceptual idea, and work through, right, from the big idea down. Well, you can work um, coterminously, or you can work simultaneously. In this, you can just graze kind of through this world. And I have to say, I, I, although I have to say also I'm completely illiterate and I'm only speaking about this <laughs> through my group of people. I can't even turn it on, really. Um, but it's irrelevant, honestly. When you're operating, you don't have to be the tool maker finally, although it's another discussion. Um, 
Well, several things happen. Um, you immediately recognize that you don't have to draw plans anymore, and you don't have to draw sections or elevations anymore, because they're, they're irrelevant. And the, the domination of the plan is something I have to say I've been fascinated with, and, and uh, maybe it shows, but the plan to me has been um, somehow sacred for, for, since, since I started working. And, um, and you realize that it's attacking a lot of these things, because it's no longer a plan, isn't even a plan really. It's, it's, it's a horizontal section, it's just a section, right? Another section to a piece of work. And that the work becomes infinitely more plastic, and well, you're interested in plasticity, and you're interested in space, and well, we spend many years drawing the section, and drawing a very repetitive section, a very a particular idea of a section, which is all about space, of course. And it was about the dimensionality, and the proportionality, and the development of space from an interior point of view, and you realize that you have a tool that can do these things. Well, this is a project that, um, that's just about finished in, in Korea. It's, 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 a, it's a little, not a tower really, a little 10-story, 11-story kind of piece of work, and it was done for a fashion designer, and it, it, it was a building where we, a uh, very, very simple piece of work, very low budget piece of work, and the, the architect, there was kind of no territory in the architecture. It's just a, it's just a volume, and what we did is we ripped off the skin and we paralleled um, interests of, of, you're looking at Isimiyaki on the top, and, um, and we paralleled it with origami and the nature of the way fabric kind of moves. And, and then I'm gonna get to it in a minute on this slide, I think. And so you're looking at this, this surface which um, completely separates the, um, the conceptual or the artistic drive of the, the, the aspiration of the work from its program. It literally detaches it. There's, there's no connection at this point. And, and, and it's one which is, um, I think I'm a conventional guy. It's still interested in these kind of simple notions of bottoms and middles and tops in this case. It's kind of a Chrysler building in a way. Just another kind of reiteration. And, and, and the top becomes kind of an event and it happens to sit in a site where the top is going to become very kind of useful in locating it. And, kind of discussing kind of its context to this, to this place. And uh, it gave us an opportunity to, to, to operate the skin in a very particular way where we could we can manipulate these folds in a way that, um, that re-articulated the this, this, this simplicity of the, the volume of the program. And then, of course, what you realize is we're not really building models anymore like we used to build models is that you really can't build a model of this project without kind of going through a more sophisticated notion of, of understanding, the, 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 again, the, the laws and the rules of this kind of folding. So what you're looking at is the building as it kind of unfolds. And well, it's kind of interesting how you kind of see these things coming because you've seen the same drawing with the, the, with the, the um, um, Salic healthcare building. And because we, we thought about the skin as something that was kind of rapid and complete. And, Right, and we'd already kind of anticipated this years before we were even thinking about it in these terms. But you realize that it's much more like f cutting fabric. And our models are that way right now. In fact, I was just talking to uh, a guy named Dick Rodiger, who we worked with years ago in Cincinnati, and he was the joint venture partner of Eisenman. And the I hadn't talked to him for a long time, and the first thing I said is, wow, you're still alive after you work with Peter. And um, they just got the building done, of course. And, and he was relating to me how they had to hire a surveyor to find, um, I think it's, I'm not very good with statistics, but I think it was something like 4,000 points in space to build this building. And I was thinking about that, God, it's really interesting. It cost them half a million dollars. And the architect wouldn't do it, and the builder wouldn't do it. So the client had to come up with half a million dollars to literally locate 4,000 points of space to make these various connections. And my instinct, and I don't mean to be crit critical of Peter, is there's something wrong here. Because it's, it's gonna be, my sense is that this is going to take place in a different way where it's, if it's related to construction, of course, Peter's not interested in construction, but if he gets interested in the construction, I think it's going to find that as one makes this piece, then in fact, no, one long, no, no one's concerned anymore with these locational events. They happen um, and are connected integrally to the making process. And what's happening here, because we gave these shop drawings to Tajima in Japan, who's building the skin, is that nobody cares where these points are. It's literally made like a pair of trousers. You, you, you make the surface, you spread it out on a computer, you make a pattern, and the, pace, the, the pieces, as they're put together, are put together within that proper geometry and are just there, right? 
but it's very much interesting. And anyway, I'm, we're off into kind of a whole series of interests now that has to do with this. And it's again a kind of a territory and that um, it, it's a tool now that's just allowing us to do things a little differently than we could do them before. And so you're seeing, of course, that pattern. And then um, another piece of work that's this, um, about halfway through construction in, in Taipei, it's a design center. And um, we're pursuing, um, we're, we're still on this, this notion of, of, of nature and, and the man-made, and we're now moving that into other types of architecture, which are, which are now using that as an inspiration or a different way of thinking about an organizational structure. Because here, we're looking at a building that has a series of random columns. And instead of using a line or a grid or any number of kind of mechanisms to, um, to neutralize or to produce the, uh, the continuity or the coherence of the space, we're using a line, but it's a line like the lawn, the cut lawn grass that's weaving through the space that are making the series of spaces for a gallery and a restaurant and a meeting space. And the model, by the way, is now a, um, a LAM model, which is, um, of course, produced to us um, out of a computer program. <coughs> And it's allowing for a, um, a shift in the language which comes out of this residual between territory of the lines of these spaces. And that's literally where the human being occupies, the space between these, these thick lines. And then a series of, uh, during all this, we're mucking around and trying to get a few buildings built and um, little bits and pieces of smaller scale work a second building for Salik, again, about the exterior, the skin, a preoccupation with the, in, the intensity of the, uh, of the envelope, um, a little building which is um, parallel, it's in Hermosa Beach, the Landa House, which is parallel to the Sixth Street House, but uses volume versus surface as the idea. The reworking of um, the old Verup studio which is the first generation of the uh, Taipei project I showed you, a series of surfaces and lines that are reorganizing a found structure. Another one for Big Daddy, um, a, a, film, a film company, which is um, um, an engagement of a series of pieces which is parallel to, it goes way back to the early projects I showed you, slightly different language. And then back to um, kind of the more serious work, um, our first project for uh, Vienna Housing, it's a project that were, uh, there were seven, seven of us are involved with. Eric, of course, is one of them. Um, and it's a work, again, where we're, we're, we're starting to tinker or, or deal with this, this idea of, of this ability to make relational structures, but now we have a tool that, that allows us to, to operate in a very different way. Um, The, this guy's name's Mahdi, and he's a, used to be my yoga instructor. And uh, I got fascinated with um, positions of a body which seem extremely unnatural, which become very natural as you understand uh, the mechanism of, of, of how this, this works, these, these positions work, both in terms of balance and muscular, musculature and, and a mental ability to um, have kind of a radical focus. And, and, um, and it, there's a parallel to what I, what I wanted this, this piece of work to do um, in terms of that balance, because he, of course, like Tatlin, right, the tower is, is, is completely in balance. It's just an illusion, right? Because you know he has to be in balance, right? And, um, but there was something else involved here, and I'll just say it really quickly, um, and it goes way back. Um, all of you probably involved with various mechanisms of uh, auto-generative work. Is that a word that, yeah? Um, the the pickup sticks, throwing down stuff, right? The, the departure point of architecture, which is, um, which is removed from the self, removed from any a priori kind of idea. And it's, I'm trying to think when I first, I don't know, Moss, when was that around? I remember St. Louis comes to mind. I remember teaching in St. Louis and we were dropping things. And it was, you know, you remember that period? I think it was mid 80s or, maybe even earlier than that, early 80s. And it's, um, there's lots of people in the school that have been connected or still connected to those ideas. Um, it, it, it takes me back, way, way back to, to the Knowles days. And um, what this is trying to do is it, it's, it, it's taking these two ideas. It's taking a, a landform, which again is part of this, this uh, evolution that I've been talking about. 
and it takes a building form, which is part of a building block of, um, of the city, a 22 meter high block, and it's, it's, it's interacting them, but, but, but we're now removed from the specificity of that interaction. We're only engaged in the operation itself, the method by which those things engage, but not the literal nature of how they engage. And the, the element you're seeing here, this, 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 um, this engagement, literally represents the integration of the land structure, this manipulated land. In this case, it's, it's, it's parking, it's social structure, it's the ancillary kind of facilities of the housing, and the housing block itself. And then like any language, like any set of rules, as you understand more and more the nature of the engagement, you can go back and manipulate it, and you can manipulate it intentionally for the various purposes, programmatic um, or private engagements. And you're looking for something, and you're, you're evaluating it within other more conventional terms, whether it be proportional or the nature of the various requirements that, that you're looking for in your architecture. Oh. Oh, I'm missing a focus, focus, reverse. And then there, there were very particular kind of things driving us on this, this project. And, it, and again, it had to do with an interest in, in difference and diversity in, in attacking the homogeneity that was our modernist tradition. And in this case, looking for a form which had a continually differentiated section so that the 150 individual social units found in this thing are all different. They're not standard. And they represent the differences in the requirements of the human being. And it's the beginning of that, of that idea. And then this interest in uh, a more conventional ar object architecture and a, an architecture which is um, more connected and rooted to its natural condition finds resonances in various projects. Um, last year, we, we got involved in the competition for the Prado, and it became, for us anyway, very obvious from the get-go that it was extremely building to, put, to, to place a building within the context of this competition. And we went to work in finding this middle zone between carving and, and manipulated landscape and the architectural requirements of this work. I think I have two projects left. Um, both of them are, are underway right now. This is the project we've been working on for, for a couple of years. And it's, um, it's, it's going to be self-explanatory, having to do with what I've talked about. It's, it's one which is um, very literally engaged in, in, in an idea of organization which uses the land, in this case, a roof surface. And um, it's attempting to move away um, in a more radical way from all the traditional notions of organization, where now the surface, the surface of the roof itself is, is, the, is the singular device or the primary device of continuity. And the forms you're looking at is the engagement of this continuous form and its intersection with a plan device, which comes from any number of programmatic kind of requirements. And um, whether the, it's literally connected to the Casper Friedrich, which has been, again, an image that it's, I've been preoccupied with for 10 years. Um, and then finally, you look at this, and the buildings that are left, the, the conventional buildings, are now more or less residual. They're the, 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 the objects that are left as a reminder of, of, the, of the tradition of architecture. But, well, it's, it's, and, it's both and. And at the same time, again, are part of a, a demarcation system of, of, of talking about um, the occupation and the, the relationship of, of moving on this vast site, a site that um, um, we had to move a bit of earth, and we moved about half as much as they, they were going to move in the beginning. And um, this is the site, I don't know, it's quite a few months old now, they've just about completed it. They've, half the project, about $12 million, was, was in the, the first earthwork and the retaining walls, and those are just getting finished, and this project is, will, um, probably start in about a month, it's out to bid at the time. And then you can see by the, the sections, um, again, the, the, the very um, kind of obvious connectedness 
as it literally is, um, is involved in reshaping, occupying the Earth's surface as it, as it produces the various requirements of the, of the school. And then as the work we've been looking at, it, it, it doesn't operate under any singular rule that these various interests collide, merge, and what you're looking at also is, is, a, is a language which shares um, ideas that come from the urbanistic projects, which are talking about the relationship of various authorities, of various structures. In this case, um, the, the open spaces, these oval shapes, the scene from the sketch, start from a social program of um, 120 children. And, it's, and again, we could go through the various elements, and all of those represent various aspects of order that are connected to this work. And then on, on, the, on the left, um, a work that is now showing the, the development of the work tectonically and um, a development of the work which is supporting the conceptual idea, not structure that's about itself or about its optimization, but about technology that's at the service of the broader intention of the work, and a, and a, and a drawing which is um, starting to show the development of the, the main central space, which is seen as a part of a, a carving of the earth as you move through the, the site and the main axis. And then early drawings, which were beginning to explore a language of surface and volume as this, this new, this intentional plate produces the major components. In this case, the, the library on the left, or a fragment of the library, both computer and, and, um, and traditional, and uh, the gymnasium and the entry sequence on the right. And again, um, drawings that are um, where we're looking at this, this, the nature of the language. This is moving from um, its planar two-dimensional description to its volumetric. And the last project I'm showing you is a project we've worked on very, very quickly over the last year that's, um, that's just starting construction. It's a project in Klagenfurt, Austria. And, um, it's an urban project. It's, it's about a million square feet. And it occupies um, the edge of the city. You're looking at the, the, the farmland that's, that's the site at this point of time. And you're looking at the site in this triangle. And you're literally looking at the beginning of urbanization. It's funny, in, 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 in Austria, I called this suburbs. And they reminded me this was called Edge City. And, um, and this, this site is going to contain um, basically the more or less traditional ingredients of a city, commercial, a banking center, housing, um, office space, um, exterior, and, and um, urban plaza space, et cetera. And I think um, in, in some way um, summarizes um, many of our interests today that I've tried to describe you, and one that, again, is, is dealing with these, the, um, the collision of these two different explorations, the, the appropriation of land and the redefinition of this, this territory of land and this nature of a, of a series of objects that come from a much more traditional place, which are um, in some way supportive of the, the convention of the fabric as it exists. It's funny, I'm getting um, a little tired. <laughs> I think uh, I've always had a uh, somewhat a difficulty talking about work, and then it's 
somehow always complete when we're finished with it. And I could always just show the slides and not say a word, really, because the whole idea is to have it self-explanatory. Um, I'm going to say everything I said about the last ones. I mean, it's literally engaged in what I've been talking about. And it's, 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 a, it's about a language, which is attempting and, and within a very different, maybe, set of rules. Um, that tries to explore this, this territory between these two worlds and find a resonance, an ability to, to speak about these two worlds. Where you're seeing, in this case, even the, the convention of this, what's left over this, this platonic language, the rectangle of the kind of found building, which is now kind of encased in the, the language of, of, um, that's emanating from the site and, um, and that is um, discussing this dialogue between these, these, two, these, two, these two traditions of, of, of making architecture. And one which is, um, hmm, it might be interesting to you that, that there's no longer any division at a, at a mechanical level between um, what look like drawings, what look like photographs or models, um, that this is basically all a singular activity because we've built this and we've developed it three-dimensionally. Three -dimensionally. And so when you're looking at these, they're essentially all the same thing, which I have to say, too, I'm finding extremely interesting. There's no longer this, this separation between these um, various mechanisms which we use to, um, to analyze or to develop or to talk about our work. Um, so the working drawings and the photographs you're looking at are literally the same thing. They're just different manifestations of the, of the, built, the built thing. And I, oh, I should say that which is obvious. Whoop. Um, and then, uh, um, the, um, along with um, ideas come the demands of reinterpreting very simple events. And in this case, um, this, this piece that moves out of the mat, because this is this large, one large, right, three dimensional mat that's literally where we left the field on the site and we left it there in perpetuity. And then these pieces demand that another response was they couldn't tolerate windows, they couldn't tolerate the language. And the skin now is an is a, is a, is a, is a outer skin, a perforated metal that, that moves and um, allows for a, a, the, uh, the continuity of a, of a fabric or a skin, which is very much part of the language of the building. And then, of course, um, one of the final litmus tests for the various engagements of the, of the elements that, that constitute the broader idea are its ability to produce space. And you're looking at um, and, and produce a diversity of space which is parallel to the, to the complexity and diversity of activities that one finds in our city today. And the, uh, the project is, is phase one and two. We're building just this end at phase one. And um, one which describes this, the, the grounding, the, literally the grounding piece that um, remains from a distance, part of this entry sequence into the city. And these fragments, these shards that move out of this structure and formulate um, um, or make an ability to produce other types of structures, which have to do with this the case, the more um, dominant kind of pieces that come from our client. I am um, extremely aware that, um, that the work I'm showing you is, um, I think, kind of radically conventional, actually. And um, I think we're confused today with the difference between language and the, um, the ideas behind that language. And it puts a lot of us together in some strange ways. And I've been through that over the last 10 years. And we've been in rooms together with eight people that are supposed to believe alike because somehow the work looks alike. And it's been fascinating that uh, it's hard to get two of us to agree on more than three things, yeah? And, there's, uh, and uh, I think it's a, a huge mistake, and it'd be a complete different topic. 
Um, but what I've shown you is, is um, I'm a person that's interested in, in evolution in a funny kind of way. And the interests I'm, that I have are, are interests that are literally about conventions. And, um, but I'm also aware that there's a group of people or there's possibilities that are, um, are attacking these conventions. Because really, if you think about the notion of materiality, I don't know, we spent, I spent, we spent, uh, what, 15 years? Kind of mucking around with the, the idea of material. And of course, we were interested in authenticity was the discussion, really, right? We were trying to find a, a, a place that we could, we could secure that said was authentic to us and our time and to architecture. And um, as I get older, I believe in less and less. I'm not sure I believe in anything, frankly. I believe in um, injustice, and I believe in uh, humor and the laugh. And I could probably rattle on certain things that I would commit myself to, that I believe in deeply. But um, the, the, the general um, concepts and groundings and notions that we place in our architecture, for me, are much more ephemeral. And they're questions. They're not ever solid. Um, and our role, I think, today, and I think the role as we move into the next century, is, is one that's profoundly engaged in questions. Because the, my sense is, I think most, many of my colleagues' sense is, that in fact, um, that architecture, the end of architecture, after architecture, um, is a very relevant discussion. And that um, regardless of our commitment and the time we've spent in engaged in an architecture that does something that we feel is important, because again, I have no claim that anything that's, that this work stands for is in fact something that I would fight for. Sounds strange. The work I would. But I don't think there's a, a literal connection between the work and its meaning, which is a broader philosophical discussion. And I'm not a philosopher. And I operate on hunches and guesses and sniffs. But my sense is that, and my sense of, of whether it's reading or discussing with people that spend much more time thinking about this, that the, the, one of the major changes that's taken place is a radical severance of our work and meaning. And I think it, it demands a very different um, position. And I think it's going to be one of the more challenging kind of aspects of our, hmm, or our pedagogy of the next generation of our schools as we start asking, I think, some very difficult questions of where, what architecture is and where it's going. And I'll leave you with these two images that were um, part of the documentation of the hippocampus. It's the part of the mind that's locating short-term memory. And, um, and for myself, um, I leave you just as images of something that's um, unfinished, um, connected to no particular intention or purpose, but um, remain to me important as um, a commitment to um, the future and an insistence on not allowing yourself to become, um, to take yourself too seriously or to get in, to allow yourself to, um, to um, not, to demand of yourself to, to continually ask questions. And I think in many cases it has to do with, with looking at each project from the ground zero. Thank you very much. I, I, one minute before you leave, could I, um, I made one faux pas at the end. Um, 
I wanted to end, there's so many people here that I know, um, so many people that uh, have, I've had the pleasure to work with. And um, the final statement I want to say is that um, uh, I think architecture today is a bit confused with the individual and the work and places way too much credibility on the character. And of course, it's just a problem of the time. And ultimately, architecture is a collective act. I couldn't even name the faces I've known. There's many, many people here that, that have been engaged, that I've been engaged with through Morphosis for the last 25 years. And I want to say um, that this work is a reflection of maybe 200 people. I don't even know. It's at least 200 people. And um, I'm an auteur. It's a joke today. I don't even quite sure. what. If you ask people in my office, I can't, they can't even tell you what I do anymore, uh, other than I seem to kind of push people around this way or that way. And um, I have to say, as, as, a, as, a, as a final footnote, I think that um, more of you in, in your educational environment should, should um, look at the possibility of a collective engagement. I think that the continuation of a notion of architecture approached by the isolated individual is absolutely completely preposterous. It's certainly available and a possibility, but it's not the only possibility. I don't mean as a singular person, but I mean as the only mode of operation. And that's certainly one of the things that's going to change in our schools is going to be a return to work that's possible within a collective stature, which allows one to, um, to uh, control one's instincts for uh, one's own notion of the way the world has to be and to engage within a collective dialogue. And I think finally we're going to find that that collective dialogue is going to be most rewarding. And I can only say for myself after 25 years, and I have absolutely no notion of changing, that that collective dialogue is inseparable to the work, whether you like it or not. And it's, it's, I am only a, a small part of that work, and that um, the work is at every level represents a collective endeavor for many people. Thanks again.